Um, let me set out, first of all, what it's not about, because I think if you know what it's not about, that'll help you get a grasp on what it is about. It begins by saying this is not a quick fix to the various difficulties that we have experienced around the community. So it's A, it's not a quick fix. B, it is not the covenant. It's not the covenant. Now that's a, a, an entirely separate enterprise, although a number of us who've been involved in this group have also been involved with the covenant process. But this is not the covenant, uh, and, and you need to be clear about that. Thirdly, it's not a code. This is not a code of law which uh, you can simply read off and say, this is the law in, let's say, the Church of England, or in the Church in Hong Kong. Um, these are principles of law which we've sort of deduced by looking at the laws of individual provinces and churches, but you can't just read it off, and you certainly can't just go along to a court and, and quote it if you're involved in litigation. Uh, it is not prescriptive. I mean by that something which you can simply uh, take and enforce uh, as, as a rule of law uh, which is directly applicable. We're not saying this is how the laws should always be because we know that in some provinces they don't have a particular law like this, but this is probably a principle that you find uh, in, in that province uh, if you looked hard enough. It may not be written down, but it may be part of what uh, is actually done. Because it's not prescriptive, it's descriptive. And finally, it's not the last word. This is very much a work in progress. There's a, a fine legal definition uh, which will get your minds buzzing. On the, it's on page 95 at the bottom of the page. And I'll read it in full because um, it's the sort of thing that repays uh, reflection. This is a definition of a principle of canon law um, as a foundational propositional maxim of general applicability which has a strong dimension of weight, is induced from the similarities of the legal systems of churches derives from the canonical tradition or other practices of the church, expresses a basic theological truth or ethical value, and is about or implicit in or underlies canon law. Now, I shall be disappointed if you don't quote that in full. In your <laughs> so it's similarly, there's a lot of law in the constitutions of uh, provinces around the world. But what this is attempting to do is to uh, get an overview of all of it and say, we can deduce from what we've looked at, that there are these principles which must underlie uh, these individual laws. These are not the laws themselves, but these are what we think must be the principles that underlie it. And as I said, a number of folk have said, well, this could actually turn out to be a kind of fifth instrument uh, of unity within the communion. Now, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be drawn into discussion of any particular case. Um, in, in the Irish, I don't know the Irish case that we're talking about, but I mean, the way in which we approach these is, is certainly in the Church of England, would be to look at a, a question of what we would call regularity, um, the difference of validity. Um, and there is, a, there is an immense jurisprudence behind all of this, but it really feeds back into um, uh, um, the earlier question about. Um, use of form, conformity to constitutional provisions and that sort of thing. Um, because you have to look at the constitution of the church um, which is doing the ordaining to determine whether it's valid by reference to that church. Recognition by other churches is a separate question. Yeah. Could you see, I'll tell you that's exactly the point. Is it irregularity and validity are two different concepts. So why don't you use the word irregular or regular rather than validity? Because their ordination theory is that the Catholic theology are valid, but they are irregular. Yes, well, I mean, we didn't use it because they're two different concepts. Yeah. We, weren't, we, weren't, we didn't want to confuse the two concepts. But there's a third issue in there yeah. within our family of churches, which is to do with recognition. And that's a, that's a different question right. again. But, so, but it seems to me that reading this, you are saying that the orders of the AMIA and Caleb Bishop are valid. That's a different question again. I mean, but, but to, you, you have to look at... Um, First of all, you look at, you know, what was the, under what authority were particular steps taken? 
in, in particular churches. Now, I've never looked into those, so I would, that's why I would not be drawn on that question. I won't have to look at that. And then you look at the question beyond that about mutual recognition. Um, uh, and then you look at uh, wider questions about exercise orders in different jurisdictions. Now, all of those are separate questions. And in a, in a, the, the reason that we are going to have to go back and do further work on all this, which is going to take some time, is because um, we will want to explore some of those in a lot more detail than you can do in, in a shorter uh, volume as this. I mean, that's why I said at the outset that this is a dis descriptive exercise. Sure, it's just it's a pretty picture. Uh, well, it, it's it's more than that because it's it's Very exploring <laughs> wonderfully, but it's it is exploring um, what what can we deduce, you know, for about our life uh, together, about our, our inheritance of, of, of faith and order um, from what we see as we look at uh, the way in which the material presents um, in the churches around the world. Um, I mean, in a sense, what you're talking about in terms of promise is really, that's to do with the covenant. But as I said at the outset, this is not the covenant. My exercise. question is, how does this feed into the covenant? Well, it's, well um, I think it would probably be illustrative in some ways of, um, of some of the material which would be encapsulated in different ways in the covenant. But the two, the, the two exercises are by no means uh, interdependent at all, and they are quite distinct and separate uh, exercises. It does, because that would suppose, um, I mean, I don't think that you're, you can suppose that um, bishops who are not here are not actually um, seeking to, um, uh, to minister um, within the Anglican tradition. That is... You know, what well, we are, we are, we are in your terms. Well, I, I think you're saying that fellowship um, has got to be fellowship, um, you know, together in a particular place. And I, I, I think we I think the church, I think Ang the Anglican Communion is rather larger than that. I, I go back to a, uh, uh, John, a phrase I, that I somebody. You're not uh, answering the definition. No, it's well, means whatever you want. What I'm saying to you is that fellowship is more than being together in one place. Or it's, it is. It is being. Uh, well, let me, uh, let me finish off what I was going to say. It is, um, somebody once said, um, do you suppose that there wasn't an Anglican communion before the First Landers Conference? And I think that's, a, that's a, an interesting thought to um, reflect on. But, uh, you know, we can be Anglican in all sorts of